Hello, hello, greetings, greetings. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, good day, good night, whatever time it is when you are watching this video. Hello and welcome. It's good to be with you. Let me get started. I'll pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. Thank you for so much that we've been able to accomplish in this moment. We know, Lord, that the only moment that we're sure of is the moment that we're in. The past is gone. The future is beyond us. But we know that you are with us wherever we are. So, Father, as we look into this session this evening, we pray, O oh God, that you would be glorified, that your name would be exalted, that your kingdom would be expanded in the earth. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, bless you, bless you. It's good to be with you. Okay, what is the date? Let's do our little scripture rant. The date is the 4th? Yes, it's the 4th of July. American Independence. Happy Independence to all my friends in the great USA. God bless you and his blessings upon your nation. Okay, the 4th of July. Let's do the 3rd, the 4th, and the 5th. Okay, the third says, Psalm 150, verse 6. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. And for the fourth, the scripture is John 11, 35. Jesus wept. And for the fifth, the scripture is 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. And it says, pray without ceasing. And those are our three scripture passages for this little segment here. Um, I have a little pamphlet that I want to possibly share with you. It's the Sword Sharpener's Prayer Toolkit. It has in it um, a layout of scriptures for the alphabet. So it's a scripture for every letter of the alphabet. alphabet. So A would be... And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And that is Romans 8, 28. And for O, oh, it would be, O oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And that's Psalm 107, verse 8. So it's a whole layout here from A to Z, A to Z the letters of the alphabet and each letter has a scripture assigned to it it is a good tool for children you can post it on the wall to teach them scriptures this is the way i taught my children scriptures i just stick a scripture on the wall and they had to go to the wall every day and recite that scripture they were all over our house so everywhere you look there was a scripture so they all know scripture very well and they know what it says and where it's found because we did it regularly and that is what we need to remember with anything when it comes to in life we've learned that anything you practice and do regularly you get better at and you begin to perfect it so the children would know a whole lot of scriptures if we teach it to them diligently so it's a little bible help for you and on the back cover is the layout of the scripture, one for every day of the month. So it has the alphabet in the middle, all the letters of the alphabet in the middle of it. And at the back it has uh, the scriptures, one scripture for every day of the month, like we do um, on, this, on, this, on these sessions. It's a little thing to help you. If you want a copy of it, you can send me an email at yvettteswain at gmail.com. Yvette T. Swain at gmail.com. Just the way my name is um, on Facebook. Yvette T. Swain at gmail.com. And I'll mail you a copy of it, email it to you, whatever way you want to get it. I'll send it to you um, and it'll help you. I'm quite sure it will help you. So God bless you. Let me continue now our session for this evening. Our topic is Jehovah is choosing his champions. Jehovah is choosing his champions. Ready? Let's go. As followers of Jesus Christ, we often find ourselves wondering why, why many of the principles of Jehovah God are ex the exact opposite of the way they are in the world. They're the exact opposite of what we do in nature and naturally in our flesh. 
why is everything opposite? Why is what he say opposite to what we would say in the world system? For example, in order to get, we have to give. In order to rule, we must serve. In order to live the abundant life, we must die to the flesh or die to self. Hmm. Wow. Everything seems to be backwards, upside down. All this is totally opposite and it's not rational. It's, a not, it's not our rational way of thinking. We don't do the opposite of what we want. We want to make a lot of money. We don't give away money. We get all the money, can all the money we get, and we sit on the can. So we don't want to do things his way. We want to do things our way because as far as we're concerned, our way is best. And it makes no sense to us to do things God's way. But when it comes to champions, when it comes to champions, we evaluate, even with champions, even with evaluating champions, we consider the great and the marvelous and the wonderful. We consider them all based on our secular mindset. We think those are the bosses, those are the champions, the ones that are great and marvelous and wonderful. But if we were to evaluate them based on the Word of God or based on Jehovah's way of thinking, we would find that they would be, what the Bible, what it says, found in wanting. They would be found wanting. Many of us desire to be champions in the kingdom of God. However, we do not understand what Jehovah requires of champions. What does he require? We have no understanding of the level of sacrifice sacrifice that comes or that goes along with the molding and the shaping of our character the way Jehovah sees us. We have no idea what goes into the molding and shaping of our character or what goes into the building of the, of the characteristics, the integrity, all of that. We have no idea what it takes. We have no idea what Jehovah requires for us to be considered champions in His eyes. So let's ask the question, who were the champions that Jehovah selected? Who were the champions that he chose? Who did he choose to be his champions? The ones that bring glory to his name. The champions, the persons he magnified, the persons he used mightily. Those who did great exploits for the kingdom of God throughout the centuries. What were their lives like? What were their lives like? What did they have to go through in order to be champions of Jehovah? But the real question is, it's okay to say I want to be a champion, but if they had any idea of the idea of the level of difficulty that they would experience throughout the process of becoming this champion, the question is, would they have embraced Jehovah's um, challenge? Would they have embraced the opportunity to be his, his would they have embraced that offer? Would they have embraced the opportunity to be his champions? Or would they have rejected it? Would they have said, Oh yes, it doesn't matter what I have to go through. I just want to be a champion in the kingdom of Jehovah. Would that have been their attitude? Or would they have said, You know what? I good. No. Mm -mm. Thanks, but no thanks. Which one do you think it would have been? Thanks, but no thanks. I'm good. I'll, I'm good just like this. I'll be just fine. Because even we, when we are successful, when we are successful and we're thinking about really embracing Jehovah's um, mandate, in, uh, uh, embracing the idea of being a champion in his kingdom, when we think of that idea and continue to reach towards it and try to embrace it, we need to remember that when we are successful and we're sitting on our pedestal and we're doing so much great things and we got everything going on, it seems as if, when Jehovah starts working on us, he slaps us off that pedestal and goes to work on us with a hammer and a chisel. And he starts banging out, beating out everything out of us that does not look like him. He starts chiseling and chopping and shaping us into his image. And most of us, for most of us, that's a whole lot of chopping and chiseling because we, we've been deep, deep trouble. We are nothing like him. So in order to become like him, he has to now take us, mold us, make us, shape us, throw us in the fire and then take us out and all that sort of stuff. So 
what exactly is a champion according to Jehovah? Who exactly does Jehovah consider a champion? Who exactly is a ch champion in Jehovah's eyesight? Who? The book of 1 Samuel chapter 17 verse 4 says, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Hmm. By the world standards, Goliath would have been a champion of champions. He was the boss. He was the big boss. Because when we translate his measurements in feet and inches, we come up with a height of approximately nine feet, nine inches. So that's how tall he was. Nine feet, nine inches tall. But while, but while he might have had optimum physique, optimum height, and a buggy load of equipment and weapon and armory, yeah, he had all of that. He did not have a covenant with Jehovah. Well, this is what David said. David said this about him. David pointed this out. The minute David got out there, David pointed out, even while David was talking to the other uh, warriors, he said, this person has no covenant with Jehovah. So, David knew that the covenant that he had with Jehovah basically guaranteed a victory for him. He could be anybody if he had a covenant with Jehovah. Regardless of what, what a Goliath had going on, he, he did not care. Because the Israelites, as Israelites, as people of God, they carried evidence or a mark of their covenant a mark that signified their covenant with Jehovah they carried that in their flesh through circumcision every boy when he turned eight days old he was circumcised on the eighth day every male child so that's the mark they carried in their flesh to confirm that they were children of Jehovah they had a covenant with Jehovah and this is why David made a bold statement a bold statement when he saw all the champions of the army of Israel they were quivering and shaking and scared out of their wits because of Goliath and in 1st Samuel 17 26 it says and David spake to the men that stood by him saying what shall be done to the man that killeth the Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And David came right back in 1 Samuel 17, 36, and he said, he was talking to Saul, and he said, Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God uncircumcised Philistine the other day I heard two, some guys talking and one of the guys said to said about it, another guy he said don't worry about him he's nothing but an uncircumcised Philistine I just started laughing because I was like what and um, yeah he's nothing but an uncircumcised Philistine I was like would you know what uncircum he's, he's an uncircumcised Philistine I tell you I started laughing laughing that was so funny to me but after a while of thinking about it, after I thought about it seriously, I realized that the phrase uncircumcised Philistine, it means nothing to us. It means nothing to us. But it had great significance to the Israelites. Circumcision was a big deal to them. To us, it's a big joke. He's an uncircumcised Philistine. Ha, ha, ha. Funny, funny, funny. But not to them. An uncircumcised Philistine meant he had no covenant with Jehovah. And to them, that covenant that they had with Jehovah, that ruled and that, 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 that voided out everything. Everything else was canceled out by their commitment and their covenant with Jehovah. Each Hebrew male child could say that I bear the mark of Jehovah in my flesh because of circumcision. I belong to Jehovah. I can prove it. I have the mark in my flesh. And this should be the conviction of every born again believer. I have the mark of Jehovah upon my life. I belong to him. 
because if we want Jehovah to use us for his glory, if we want him to select us as champions, we must bear his mark. But all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy, the Israelites demonstrated that the mark in their foreskin was not working. It started out well. It started out being a good mark. But after a while, it was not working anymore. For some of the folks, it was just a mark. Some of the men, it was, oh, yeah, yeah, I got the mark. Yeah, I good. And they, it, was, it meant nothing to them. It did not provoke them to live righteous. It did not mean very much to them. They knew that they were marked for Jehovah and for his kingdom, but they worshipped idols. They indulged in works of the flesh. Some of them were worse than the heathens in the lands that they lived. They were not keeping the covenant, covenant that they were. They were not living up to the covenant that they held with Jehovah. In Deuteronomy 10, 16, it says, Circumcise, therefore, the foreskins of your heart. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked, stiff-necked, stiff-necked. When Jehovah was selecting his champions, he was seeking those whose hearts were circumcised, whose hearts were pure, not just in their flesh, but also in their spirit, in their heart, in the spirit of their heart, they were circumcised. In order to be a champion of Jehovah, he needed, you needed to be circumcised in your heart. In today's world, when we think of champions, we think of the top boss who has no one to answer to. I don't answer to nobody as the boss. That's the champion. That's the, that's the master. The champion makes all the final decisions. The, fi the final decisions are made by the champion. Physically, he's usually tall and strong and ripped and powerful. You know, like Superman. Yeah, Superman. Or like Thor. You know Thor? Yeah. Like Superman or like Thor with the hammer. Yeah, like that. Or if you want to go AI, he would probably be Optimus Prime. Yeah. I mean, even his voice says authority. So these are the kind of people or images we would get in our mind when we think of champions. When we think of champions, these are the kind of things we think of. Because in order to for a champion, but in order to be a champion in Jehovah's kingdom, we would have to cast off every carnal action, every carnal attitude. Cast it off, lay it down. That is considered a great Anything we consider great by man's standards, we would have to cast it off and cast it aside. But as we look at those that Jehovah considered to be great champions, they truly were not the same quality that we would see in the world today. They were not that. They were not the strong, burly, muscular type. Those were not the ones that Jehovah was looking for, remember? He was not looking for the works of the flesh. He's looking for the works of the spirit. Let's consider and contrast between the amazing Saul and the shepherd boy David. In the book of Samuel chapter 1, no, 1 Samuel, sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 9 verse 2. It says, and he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he for his shoulders and upwards he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upwards he were he was higher than any of the people amazingly true champions in Jehovah's kingdom are barely they're, they're rarely big they're not big thick strong no Saul was a champion. He was, he was considered champion material. He was tall and big and strong. But you have to remember the people chose Saul. The people asked God to give them a king. So they chose a king. God gave them a king that they would think would st was strong and mighty and all that. Saul was physically fit. He looked. He was looked upon as a champion. But when we study the life of Saul, we would not use the word champion to describe his life. He didn't live the life of a champion because although he was physically fit, 
although he looked like a champion to his royal subjects, he was spiritually bankrupt. He was spiritually bankrupt. So in the eyes of the Lord, he was not a champion. The Lord didn't consider him a champion. Why? Because all of his wonderful statistics were external. All of the wonderful things you could say about him was external, flesh, carnal. Everything about him was carnal and fleshy. In the flesh, he was strong and all that. That was carnal. The Lord considers that carnal. What about your spirit? What about your heart? And when Saul's reign came to an end, Jehovah issued his report card. The report card for Saul's life. And 1 Samuel 16 verse 1 says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. So, the Lord said he rejected Saul. Yes, Saul looked the part. He looked like, like king material. But he lacked character. He lacked character. He lacked integrity. And the main ingredient that he lacked he lacked the anointing of Jehovah God. He lacked the anointing. He was not anointed. Now, let's take a look at David. And here's how David is described in 1 Samuel 16, verses 12 to 13. And it says, And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, and with all of a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. I always found the word ruddy when it described David as ruddy, as kind of strange, but it simply means rough dusty and be spending all the days out in the pasture chasing down the sheep and making sure they were okay so he was rough and dusty but he was also strong so ruddy means rough dusty and strong but what mattered most about David's life is that he was anointed he was anointed the scripture says and the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward throughout his whole life he was anointed he had the spirit of the Lord upon him we have heard it said over and over and over again the anointing makes the difference it does the anointing makes the difference David loved Jehovah David loved his God he loved him when he was alone out in the pastures watching his father's sheep he loved Jehovah when he was standing before Goliath he loved Jehovah when he led the street party, the street praise party, where say David danced all out of his clothes. He was loving Jehovah then when he entered into to the city of Jerusalem. He loved Jehovah when he was crowned king of Israel. David loved Jehovah. He loved Jehovah when the prophet Nathan rebuked him for his sin with Bathsheba. He was still loving his God. And he was willing to submit, to repent. David loved God. The book of Acts attests to this. It says, Acts chapter 13, verse 22, and it says, And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave their testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. God stamped his approval on David. He was pleased with David. He said, he's a man after my own heart. This is how Jehovah chooses his champions. This is how he chooses them. He inspects their heart. And once their hearts are right before him, he anoints them for service in his kingdom. He 
he identifies that their hearts are right, then he anoints them to serve in his kingdom. And it is because of his anointing that his champions are able to endure the preparation process. Yes, there's a preparation process. Because every champion, every champion must go through it. Every one of Jehovah's champions goes through it. As we look at those that Jehovah selected, we see that when they transgressed the law of Jehovah, Jehovah took out the hammer and chisel and he went to work. And he mashed them up and beat them into subjection. Because they gave their heart to him, he placed his anointing on them, so he needed to get them in shape. But when they followed his law, their, their lives were tremendously blessed. When they followed the laws of Jehovah, their lives were tremendously blessed. And we same, see the same pattern in our lives. We see the same pattern in our lives when we walk with the Lord. When we obey, when we obey, we are blessed. But when we willfully sin against Jehovah, we find ourselves in deep distress and despair. Deep distress and despair. Let's take a moment to consider the life of Joseph the favorite son of his father, Jacob. See, Joseph was living the life, robed in a, in a beautiful handmade robe. I mean, a gift. The gift elevated him above, above his brothers. They're trying to figure out, well, how he get a robe and we don't get none? We older than him. We was here before him. How he get a robe and we don't get one? So, Joseph was decked in a robe. Genesis 37.3 says that Joseph was loved it says, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Favoritism. Because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. What a wonderful life Joseph had. He was sitting high, sitting high on his pedestal, showered with love and adoration by his father. You know, sitting up there perched like a bird on the... Yes, he gets all the best of everything is for Joseph. But oh boy, if Joseph only knew what was waiting ahead of him, what he was going to have to go through. Because Jehovah not only, and he had not only chosen Joseph to be ruler over his 12, his 11 brothers and the household and Jacob's little farm there. He, uh, Jehovah had much bigger things for Joseph. He had bigger plans for Joseph. His plan for Joseph was for Joseph to reign over a foreign nation not his father and the 200 sheep and his 12, 11 brothers and all that no jehovah had nations plan for joseph to rule over he his plan was for joseph to rule nations and not only nations a foreign nation joseph was going to rule a nation and not an israel israel nation nation of israel he was going to rule a foreign nation Genesis 37 23 talks about Joseph being captured okay everything going downhill now and it says and it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brothers that they stripped Joseph out of his coat his coat of many colors that was on him so now Joseph is captured no more pretty coat no more best of everything for you none of that it's time for you to, to, to really go through the mill now. Okay, Genesis 37, 28 talks about it being, him being sold as a slave. And it says, then they're passed by Midianite, Midianites, merchant men. And they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. Okay, now... Now he's sold as a slave. Genesis 39 verse 1, he's now bought as a slave. And it says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. So now he was captured, sold as a slave, bought on the auction blocks and still not done after he got on the wrong side of Potiphar's wife and she wound up lying on him and saying he tried to rape her 
Now, in Genesis 29, 30, he's thrown into prison. He's getting a hammer, a chisel, and a nail. And Joseph, it says, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in prison. Everything. He getting the whole treatment. As we look through the life of Joseph, we see that everywhere that Joseph went, the pit, the desert, the auction block, the fields of Egypt, even in prison, there is one phrase that is always, always, always constant. A phrase that is always constantly being said about Joseph. And in Genesis 39 verse 21, it says, But the Lord was with Joseph. But the Lord was with Joseph and shew him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Everywhere Joseph went, he was in difficult situations, but he had favor. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. And in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 5, it says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Joseph could say that this was fulfilled in his life. Because although he, was, he went through a whole lot of hard times, the Lord never left him never left him, was always with him. And that's what we must remember. Jehovah said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And that's Hebrews 13, 5. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So, to all us, all of us, who aspire to be Jehovah's champions, you know, we talk a big talk. But if we aspire to be Jehovah's champions, those of us who aspire to do great exploits in his kingdom, let's always, always, always remember that the making of a champion is hard. The making of a champion is hard. Jehovah's champions spend many hours in the Word. Champions are not lazy. The champions of Jehovah are diligent. They work hard. It is difficult. Sometimes difficulties come your way. They spend many, many, many hours in prayer. Champions of Jehovah, they spend many hours in prayer. They do not get everything they want. If you're going to be a champion, you know what it's like out on the battlefield. Out on the battlefield, they would have loved some chocolate cake. They didn't get the chocolate cake. Cafeteria ain't serving no chocolate cake today. You eat what's there. You're not going to get everything you want. Not going to be able to do anything you feel, any and everything you feel like doing. No. They can't do what they want. They can't do what they feel like doing. They can't say what they feel like saying. The making of a champion is hard. It's hard work. Sometimes Jehovah will even step aside and give the enemy access to you. To give you strength, to strengthen you. To cause you to realize that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If we never get pressure, if we never get stress, if we never get that pressing from the enemy, we will never really experience the fact that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Talking about Jehovah stepping off and leaving you and letting the enemy have access to you. Ask Job. Job knew all about that. He walked through that. But just like the father, like a father teaching his beloved child how to swim, and teaching the children how to swim, they're going to drink some water. Mm -hmm. In learning how to, they're going to drink some water. And sometimes you're going to go down and you're going to feel like, this is my last. Oh, I'm going to make it through this one. And you go down and before you know it, Jehovah picks you up and brings you back to the surface again, sputtering and choking and everything. But you, you're up, you're up, you're not dead, you haven't perished, he hasn't left you, he hasn't abandoned you. He still bring you right back up to the surface and you carry on. But just like a parent teaching their child to swim, you're going to drink some water and sometimes you're going to feel like it's all over. But it will not be over. Jehovah tells us in his word 365 times, two words, fear not. It may be difficult, it may be hard, but fear not. In the book of Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 it says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. 
Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. What a promise. I will never, fear not for I am with thee. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Promises that we can look at when we are struggling to catch our breath. Struggling to hold on. I usually tell the Lord, Lord hold on to me. My gripping is strong enough. I need you to hold me. Hold me like a prisoner. Hold me because I get a little crazy now and then. And my gripping is strong. So Lord I need you to hold me. So when we feel like we can't, we don't know what we can do next, remember, he said, fear not, for I am with you. So stand firm. Stand firm, child of the Most High God. Stand firm. Stand firm. Embrace the call that Jehovah God is calling, calling you to be his champion. Embrace that call. Jump on that. Grab, yes embrace that call allow him to chisel and chop and shuffle off and brush off and scrub off yes allow him to do all that all those things in your life because they will cause you to look like him he's shaping you to his image to his likeness will it hurt oh yes will it be difficult mm -hmm. very difficult but he is with you. You can go through it if you remember. Just always remember that He is with you. And how does, like the old saying, old saying six, the old saying goes, you know the thing we always say? What does it say? What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. He is not working on you to kill you. He's working on you to make you stronger. That's what He's doing to us. Working on us to make us stronger. So, child of the most high God put on your armor put on the whole armor of God every day every day put on the whole armor of God put that armor on and know for a surety that Jehovah God is calling his he's calling he's calling he's calling he is calling Jehovah is calling he is calling his troops to himself first John 4 verse 4 says ye are of God little children and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world you won't be defeated you'll make it Jehovah will bring you through what is say with flying colors with ribbons to ribbons to boot he will bring you through with flying colors so suit up child of God because Jehovah is choosing his champions God bless you bless you thank you so much for joining me I greatly appreciate you spending these moments with me let me pray and close Heavenly Father we thank you we thank you for the golden opportunity to allow you to use us for your glory Father help us to not grow weary and well-doing Help us to remember that we will reap if we faint not. We'll reap in due season, but we will reap if we faint not. Help us to remember that you told us 365 times, fear not. So Father, we embrace, we embrace the call. Call us to be your champions and we will say yes. Our answer will be yes. Call us, Lord. Continue to draw us to yourself. Draw us closer, ever closer to you, Lord, that we may be shaped and molded and born into your image. Structured into the image of Jesus Christ. We pray, O oh God, that as you do this, as we continue to surrender, you continue to shape us and mold us. Bless us now, we pray, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, bless you. Thank you so much for being with me. And I pray that something I said resonated with you, was a help to you, helps you to grow in grace, to make another step towards the kingdom of God. 
towards his goodness, towards his grace, towards his love, towards his peace. Because there's nothing quite like serving the Lord. Have a good day, good night, whatever time it is where you are. And like I always say, you could have been doing anything else, but you decided to spend these moments with me. Thank you ever so much, and may Jehovah continually bless your life. Goodbye.